Welcome to this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizula. Joining me today is Dr. Manuel Maya, a postdoctoral research fellow at the City of Hope's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Maya, wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So here we are at the ASCO GEO 2017 Symposium, and I know that there are many abstracts highlighting circulating tumor DNA. Can you delineate for us differences or advantages of the circulating tumor DNA versus conventional biopsy? Yeah, this is actually very exciting because liquid biopsies, uh, the circulating tumor DNA analysis that uh, have been done uh, recently is uh, very, there are many advantages over uh, conventional biopsies since it's more convenient for both patients and physicians uh, since it does avoid uh, invasive procedures as well as its complication. And also it's not so uncommon to have uh, a lack of enough material for genomic profile with conventional biopsies. So liquid biopsies give this opportunity for us to study uh, genomic profile of tumor patients or tumor DNA from patients, and some studies have been shown have shown also that it's a good opportunity for us to monitor for disease regression and progression. Although it has still to be validated, uh, it's a good enough opportunity for us to correlate uh, the higher number of circulating tumor DNA with uh, survival outcomes in some instances. Tell us about the abstracts on <coughs> circulating tumor DNA as it relates to prostate cancer first. Yeah, in prostate cancer, there are many abstracts showing us that there is a good relationship with uh, the higher the presence and the number of gene alterations with clinical prognostic factors as well as clinical outcomes, and this is very exciting, particularly for androgen receptor amplification and copy number alterations, since uh, these alterations have been shown to correlate with shorter time of to treatment failure as well as uh, an overall survival. What about in bladder cancer? Well, in bladder cancer, as with prostate cancer, there are many abstracts showing that there is a relationship between the number of gene alterations found and patient's survival outcomes. And particularly, <coughs> some uh, gene mutations such as FGFR mutations are associated uh, with a poor outcome. And this is very interesting because last year we had this abstract presented by Dr. Paul from City of Hope at, from California showing that a new drug is being developed and targeting FGFR in, uh, receptor, which is uh, a good thing for us to build new targeting uh, therapies for these patients. And what finally a kidney cancer? Tell me about those abstracts. There is this very interesting uh, abstract from Dr. Paul from City of Hope that has shown that there is a changing genomic landscape when patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma progress from first to second line uh, therapies. And these genomic alterations uh, also correlate with patient survival and gives us the opportunity to target some uh, possible mechanisms of resistance, such as mTOR pathway and p53 alterations. Wow, that's amazing. We're looking forward to seeing more information on that. Now, there's also data at this meeting for using mesazantrone as adjuvant therapy in high-risk localized prostate cancer in the SWOG trial. What does this <coughs> data show and how does it influence clinical practice? Yes, this was the SWOG S9921 uh, phase three clinical trial that randomized patients with localized prostate cancer just after radical prostatectomy to androgen deprivation therapy for two years or uh, androgen deprivation therapy with chemotherapy with mitogentron for six cycles. And the primary endpoint of this study was overall survival. Uh, in fact, this study was stopped earlier because there was a high incidence of acute leukemia among patients in the chemotherapy arm. And this study did not meet its primary endpoint, meaning that it was a negative trial. So these results are comparable to those results of docetaxel, adjuvant docetaxel in high-risk prostate cancer patients uh, that we have seen with the STEMP trial. So at this point, there is no data to support the use of, of adjuvant chemotherapy in high-risk prostate cancer patients. Absolutely. Well, I know that you're coming to us as well from Brazil, the beautiful country Brazil, and you're here in the U.S. to pursue your research fellowship at the City of Hope. Can you step back and give us a quick comparison of medical practice and maybe even the research realm in Brazil versus the U.S. and some pros and cons as well? Yes, absolutely. Well, there is a unique opportunity for me to come here because there are many major differences 
between uh, US and Brazilian uh, clinical practices. And I think the most important one, what actually brought me here is that uh, clinical practice here in the US is very research focused. And this is very important for clinical oncology since most of our more important advances come from translational medicine. So this is very, very interesting for us. And sure. another major difference is that in Brazil, a medical oncologist can rarely focus in a group of diseases or a disease side. So most oncologists end up treating every treatment, uh, every I cancer see. patient. And it makes harder for us to cope up with uh, the many published material that are coming through. Sure. Well, we are going to wish you lots of luck on your journey in research fellowship. And just finally, you know, beyond what we've already discussed, are there any other highlights from this ASCO GU 2017 symposium that you'd like to delineate for our viewership? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some very interesting abstract presented here in this meeting. Uh, one that I found really useful and interesting is one that compares clinical outcomes uh, regarding overall survival and risk of recurrence and metastatic disease from patients that have gone, af, uh, have gone to uh, radical prostatectomy. So they're using uh, tools, genomic tools, such as the CIFR and Oncotype in order to predict the risk of recurrence for these patients. And this is, uh, this is actually very helpful for us since we can better classify patients with a higher risk of recurrence and therefore offer uh, more options for adjuvant clinical trials for this specific population. Uh, another interesting finding is that there are some uh, molecular subtypes in bladder cancer patients that can actually correlate with response to new adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is a very interesting point because we can actually uh, better select those patients who are more uh, prone to have a, 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 a response to chemotherapy and avoid giving this treatment option for those who are less likely to respond. So these are... Excellent. Well, there's so much going on here, I'm sure. It's yeah. hard to really highlight just a few. Well, we want to wish you a lot of good luck on your journey here as a, as a fellow, and we're very happy that you're bringing your mental acumen and helping to strengthen the medicine, research, and science from a global perspective. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, and very it was a great opportunity to share. Excellent. What? And to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us for this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizullah.